So let's start from the beginning by asking ourselves, what is machine learning and why do we need it in our lives? Firstly, what is machine learning? Webster's Dictionary defines machine learning as the ability of a machine to improve its own performance. It does so by using a statistical model to make decisions and incorporating the results of each new trial into that model. In essence, the machine is programmed through trial and error. Now, if you're a complete newbie to machine learning, you're probably thinking, There are a lot of long words in there, Miss We're Not, but humble pirates. So let's instead try and break down this complex definition using a simple example. We are on the island of Ara Mamore. On the island, there is a farm owned by Farmer Jack. One morning, Farmer Jack decides to take a drive into town to buy some donuts. When he gets back home, he decides to leave the donuts on his front porch table and then goes inside to make some tea. He comes out five minutes later with his tea, but to his shock and despair, realizes that his donuts are gone. Farmer Jack must know where his donuts went. His neighbor, Farmer Earl, who lives on a neighboring farm, tells Farmer Jack that he saw what happened. Farmer Earl tells Farmer Jack that his donuts were stolen by an animal. Now, while Farmer Earl was a witness to this horrific theft, he also lives about 100 meters away, so the culprit that he saw wasn't exactly completely clear to him. As much as he wasn't able to definitively identify the animal, he still picked out a few features of it that he was certain of. The animal definitely walked on two legs, was brown, had long ears, and wore no clothes. So if we had to write this out, the unknown animal had two legs, was brown in color, had long ears, and wore no clothes. This could be rewritten into something called a feature vector, in which on the left-hand side, we have the features of the sample, and on the right-hand side, we have the classification of it. In our case, we do not have the classification, which we are going to try to find from this point. I would suggest that it's a good idea to write this down as it would help following along as we move on from this point. Now, Farmer Jack has four animals on his farm. These animals are humans, brown horses, kangaroos, and brown bears. Humans have two legs, are human colored, have short ears, and do wear clothes. Brown horses have four legs, are brown in color, have long ears, and do not wear clothes. Kangaroos have two legs, are brown in color, have long ears, and do not wear clothes. And finally, brown bears have two legs, are brown in color, have short ears, and do not wear clothes. In his attempt to find the culprit, Farmer Jack decides to employ two computer programmers, Fred and George, to create programs that will output the most likely animal. Fred decides to use a traditional programming approach to create his program, while George decides to use a machine learning approach. For Fred's traditional approach, these are the steps that he needs to take. He first needs to look at the feature vectors of the animals on Farmer Jack's farm. So if you recall, Farmer Jack had humans, brown horses, kangaroos, and brown bears. He would then open up a coding environment on his computer and then proceed to manually code out the program. So based on the feature vectors, the program would look something like this, where 
if the animal had two legs and is human colored and had short ears and wears clothes, this animal would be classified as a human. In a similar way, if the animal meets the conditions that would result in it being classified as a kangaroo, it would be classified as a kangaroo, and the same if it met the conditions of being classified as a brown horse or brown bear. Once Fred has completed his program, he would then take the features of the unknown animal and input them into the program to get a classification. According to this program, the unknown animal cannot be a human as it meets only one out of the four conditions to classify it as such, that being the unknown animal walks on two legs. Similarly, it cannot be a brown horse or brown bear as it does not meet the requirements for those classifications either. This leaves the unknown animal possibly being a kangaroo. When the unknown animal's features are passed into the system, it shows that it meets the requirements of being classified as a kangaroo in that the unknown animal has two legs, is brown, has long ears, and does not wear clothes. So ultimately, according to the program, we get to the answer that the unknown animal is a kangaroo. Now, even though Fred's program gives the desired outputs, the problem is that he has to manually create this program. Fred has to physically sit at his desk and type out code to create this program. Doing so, he wastes an unnecessary amount of energy and time, which could be spent enjoying his life or thinking about the meaning of existence and his place in the universe. On top of that, if we had a situation where each animal has more attributes to code for, or there were different variations of the animals, or there were more animals on the farm to code for, then Fred would have to spend more time coding the program to classify the unknown animal. Now, George, on the other hand, decided against using a traditional programming approach and instead decided to go for a machine learning approach. Before I describe how George implements his machine learning approach, let's first talk about an important word, the word hypothesis. A hypothesis is essentially a calculated guess that helps us to understand reality by creating a model of how an aspect of the universe works. Hypotheses are not always completely accurate the first time, but instead tend to evolve over time to become closer to a model of reality that represents the absolute truth. For example, let's look at the sun. In ancient Greek mythology, the sun was in a literal sense considered to be the Greek god Helios riding his chariot across the night sky, bringing daytime during his presence and nightfall in his absence. As much as the ancient Greeks thought this was the absolute truth, it was merely just a hypothesis that allowed them to model the universe in a way that helped them to understand it. Fast forward to around 150 AD, and we get to Ptolemy, who described the Earth as a stationary object located in the center of the universe, being orbited by a giant ball of flaming gas called the Sun. This too, as much as it was considered the absolute truth, was still just a hypothesis. Fast forward a little more to 1500 AD, and we get to Copernicus, who described the sun to be a giant ball of gas that the Earth and other planets revolved around. This is the current model of reality that we use today, and according to the latest in scientific advancements, seems to be the absolute truth. If anything, it is at least an extremely reliable model of reality. Maybe one day this will be proven to be incorrect, and the absolute truth is really... Aliens. These four hypotheses make up a small part of what is known as the hypothesis space. 
A hypothesis space refers to all possible hypotheses that serve to model or explain a particular aspect of the universe. In the case of the Sun, the hypothesis space would refer to every single possible theory of what the Sun is and how it works in relation to the Earth. So coming back to George's machine learning approach, step one would be for George to take the feature vectors of the known animals, that being the human, brown horse, kangaroo, and brown bear, and inputting them into the computer. From this point, he would simply run a few lines of code to get the computer or machine to automatically write the program for him. When George runs that code, he could simply get up from his chair and go and get some coffee while the machine does his work for him. While he is away from his desk, this is what is happening in the machine. The machine randomly generates a possible program or model to identify an unknown animal based on its input features. This program may not be 100% accurate, but it is a potential solution. We shall call this model hypothesis 1. The machine would then take the inputted feature vectors of the known animals and use these to test the accuracy of the model, hypothesis 1. If we cross-check hypothesis 1 with the known feature vectors, we see that a human, according to hypothesis 1, is brown in color, but according to the known feature vectors, is supposed to be human-colored, so this is wrong. In a similar way, a horse, according to this hypothesis, requires two legs to be classified as such. However, according to the known feature vectors, should require four legs, so this is also wrong. A kangaroo is shown by the hypothesis to be human-colored, but according to the known feature vectors is brown, so this is wrong. And finally, a brown bear has four legs according to the hypothesis, when, according to the known feature vectors, should in fact have two, so this is wrong. This model is incapable of correctly predicting any animal, which makes it 0% accurate. At this point, the machine decides to form another model, hypothesis 2. To do this, it swaps the brown color condition from humans with the human color condition from kangaroos. When we look at the new model, we see that the hypothesis's conditions to classify a kangaroo and the known feature vectors conditions to classify a kangaroo, which represent the ground truth, are a complete match. However, the conditions to classify the humans, brown horses, and brown bears, according to the hypothesis, do not correspond to the base truth conditions found in the known feature vectors. Since this model can only classify one out of the four animals correctly, it is deemed to be 25% accurate. From this point, the machine creates even more hypotheses by randomly swapping conditions over a number of iterations. Finally, it gets to a point at which each block of conditions to classify the animals completely match the ground truth shown by the known feature vectors. At this point, we have a model that is 100% accurate. This model was created automatically with barely any human efforts or supervision. George, at this point, would come back to the computer, take the feature vector of the unknown animal, input it into the machine learning model, and get the answer that the animal is a kangaroo. Another benefit of using machine learning is that if we had a situation where there were more features or different variations of the animals, or more animals to code for, this would not affect George's efforts as his pass in all of this is to input the known feature vectors and wait for the machine to code a classification model by itself. This would take the same effort regardless of how his data looked. This process of building models to solve problems can be applied to pretty much any sector that you can think of. Whether we are talking about a physician trying to diagnose patients based on symptoms, or a financial trader trying to determine whether a stock price will move up or down based on certain factors, or an engineer trying to maximize the outputs of a chemical mixing system by optimizing the widths of the pipes that are responsible for bringing the chemicals together, or even a horse racing fanatic 
who wants to build a model to predict the winner of horse races based on previous races and other factors. An understanding of machine learning is a powerful way to help take any endeavor to the next level. To finally wrap up this explanation, we can look at the two diagrams on the screen that show the traditional approach to programming, which requires a human programmer to manually build a program, which then takes inputs and produces the desired outputs, versus a machine learning approach, which involves a machine taking inputs and outputs and using them to build a program instead. This brings us to the end of this general explanation of how machine learning works. Now, while this explanation might give us a good understanding, we have really just scratched the surface of the subject at this point. In the up and coming videos, we will discuss, among other things, the different types of machine learning algorithms, how to properly choose which algorithm to use in which context, how to measure the performance of different algorithms, and through doing so, gauging which algorithm may be better suited to a specific task, reducing data into dimensions that make it easier to visualize, as well as more nuanced aspects of machine learning. In this video, we are going to go over the procedure of installing Python and Jupyter Notebook on a Windows machine. Now, Python is the programming language, and Jupyter Notebook is the development environment that we are going to use when doing our practical exercises. To install Python, first open a web browser tab and Google search Python installation. Click the link that says Download Python. Now, click the yellow button shown here to install the latest version of Python. This will begin the download of an executable file that installs Python on your machine. Once the download is complete, click the executable file. This will open up the installer. Ensure that the box to add Python to your path variables is ticked and click Install. Now it will begin installing. Once this is done, click Close. Once we install Python, we automatically install a package called pip. Pip is a tool that helps us install other Python packages very easily. This will come in useful throughout this course. Now go back to your main screen. Go to the search bar, type in cmd, and click the command prompt application. This should open up the command prompt to check if Python has been installed. Type in Python version and click enter. This should run the latest version of Python that you have just installed. If it does not, Python has not been installed, and you may need to retake the steps in this video. To check if pip is installed, which it should be, type pip dash dash version and click enter. The next step is to install Jupyter Notebook. Open a web browser and Google search Jupyter Notebook. Click the link that says installing Jupyter. This should take you to this page. Scroll to the bottom and find specific instructions on how to install Jupyter Notebook. As we can see here, the command to install Jupyter Notebook is highlighted here. Go back to the command prompt and insert that command. Pip helps us to easily install Jupyter Notebook. When the installation is complete, we need to run Jupyter Notebook. According to the website, to run the notebook, we need to run this command. Insert that command into the command prompt. This should open up Jibbit's Notebook in your web browser. Click the drop down that says New and then click Python 3 iPyKernel. This opens up the Jibbit's Notebook development environment. Type the following code into the first cell to test out the notebook. This should print out 11, which is the sum of 4 and 7. To end the notebook session, click the stop button and close the browser tab and command prompt.
and voila, we have successfully installed Jupyter Notebook. TensorFlow is a library that allows us to easily build neural networks and a necessary library to have installed for this course. To install TensorFlow, open the command prompt, type in pip install TensorFlow, and simply wait for it to complete downloading and installing. We also need to install three other libraries, Pandas, NumPy, and sklearn to help us process data. To install Pandas, enter the command pip install pandas. To install numpy, type in pip install numpy. And to install sklearn, type in the command shown here. Please note that you may already have some of these libraries installed by default. In the introductory video, we covered the use of supervised machine learning to create a classification model that would help Farmer Jack find the perpetrator responsible for his missing donuts. In this video, we will continue along this path by introducing a popular machine learning algorithm, the artificial neural network. To help explain how artificial neural networks work, let's go back to the island of Aramamore. On the island, there is a neighboring farm to Farmer Jack's, owned by Farmer Rose. Now, Farmer Rose has entered the National Flower Contest. To win this contest, a contestant needs to present three different types of flowers. A panel of flower experts would then judge the flowers, awarding them points based on features such as height, intensity of petal color, and overall beauty of the flower. Farmer Rose decides that she wants to present hydrangeas, daisies, and sunflowers at the contest. Now, unlike normal flowers that you would find in your garden, which need minimal effort and care to grow, a prize-worthy flower needs the right amount of water at the right timing to grow optimally. Farmer Rose builds a plumbing system that takes in a certain amount of water and waters each plant accordingly. The plumbing system only waters the plants on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, as prize-winning flowers only need to be watered three days a week. The water is channeled directly from the rainfall of that day, which means that the amount of rain on a given day is what is inputted into the plumbing system. At this point, if you feel the need, you may want to take out some paper and pen for notes as we are about to go into some figures. On a Monday on the island, it always rains enough for 10 liters of water to be inputted into the plumbing system. On a Tuesday, it only rains enough for 20 liters to be inputted into the plumbing system. And on a Wednesday, it only rains enough for 15 liters to be inputted into the plumbing system. In addition, the three different flowers require different amounts of water each day. The hydrangeas require 2.8 liters on a Monday, 5.6 liters on a Tuesday, and 4.2 liters on a Wednesday. The daisies require 2.1 liters on a Monday, 4.2 liters on a Tuesday, and 3.15 liters on a Wednesday. And finally, the sunflowers require 2.1 liters on a Monday, 4.2 liters on a Tuesday, and 3.15 liters on a Wednesday. If this was a little confusing or hard to remember, just remember that on a Monday, 10 liters of water go in, and 2.8 liters need to go to the hydrangeas, 2.1 to the daisies, and 2.1 to the sunflowers. On a Tuesday, 20 liters of water go in, and 5.6 liters need to go to the hydrangeas, 4.2 to the daisies, and 4.2 to the sunflowers. And on a Wednesday, 15 liters of water go in, 4.2 liters go to the hydrangeas, 3.15 to the daisies, and 3.15 to the sunflowers. So basically, an input of 10 should give you an output of 2.8, 2.1, and 2.1. An input of 20 should give you an output of 5.6, 4.2, and 4.2. And an input of 15 should give you an output of 4.2, 3.5, 4.1, 
3.15 and 3.15. Now let's get into Farmer Rose's plumbing system. The plumbing system consists of four pipes altogether and a special device connecting the four pipes. For our purposes, we shall call this device a gizmo. This gizmo is a special type of gizmo and is blue in color. So let's call it a blue gizmo. Each pipe has an electronic valve that automatically adjusts the pipe's width, which results in different amounts of water flowing out of each pipe. The blue gizmo is responsible for taking the water from the pipe on the left and distributing it through the pipes on the right. The blue gizmo also ensures that the plants only get watered on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. It does this through a special built-in mechanism that allows the same amount of water coming in from the pipe on the left to be passed onto the pipes on the right if and only if the water coming in from the left pipe is equal to or above 5 litres. If it is below 5 litres, the mechanism prevents the water from flowing through and instead passes the water into a nearby stream. Given that on Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, the rainfall does not produce enough water to pass through, this means that the plants are not watered on these days, which is ideal. If we are to draw a graph to describe this mechanism, it would look something like this, where up until there are 5 litres of water coming in from the left pipe, there will be no water being distributed into the pipes on the right. At the point that 5 litres of water are being pumped through the left pipe, and after any more than 5 litres of water are being pumped through the left pipe, the mechanism allows the same amount of water being pumped from the left pipe into the pipes on the right. On Monday, as usual, 10 litres of rainwater enter the system through the left pipe. Now, the initial widths of the pipes are randomly configured by the system. We can think of this as hypothesis 1. The first possible configuration of the pipe widths are shown on the screen. As we can see, on a Monday, 10 litres of water go into the pipe. However, the pipe's width is only 0.4, which means that only 40% of the water coming in can make it through. This means that only 4 litres make it to the blue gizmo, which isn't enough for the blue gizmo to let the water through, and therefore no water passes into the pipes on the right. This results in 0 litres of water being outputted to each plant, which does not correspond to the required outputs for Monday. From this point, the widths of the valves are recalibrated to form hypothesis 2. However, it is a new day, Tuesday, and now we input 20 litres of water. The new width of the pipe on the left is 0.7, so only 70% of the water on that day goes through. This means that the gizmo gets 14 litres of water. However, this is enough to allow the gizmo to let the water through. Only 35% of the 14 litres gets passed onto the hydrangeas, which is 4.9 litres. Only 40% gets passed to the daisies, which is 5.6 litres. And only 25% gets passed to the sunflowers, which is 3.5 litres. This isn't the required amount of water for each flower type on each day, and hence this hypothesis isn't completely accurate. A new hypothesis is formed for Wednesday, which results in a plumbing system with the pipe widths being a little closer to what is required. Then this process repeats with Monday and continues to repeat. Eventually, the pipe widths will reach values that supply the required amount of water for each plant on the required days. Now, Farmer Rose has an idea to add fertilized water high in nitrogen and fertilized water high in phosphorus to a system. These waters need to be added in separately. The fertilizers are also added in different amounts on different days. The plants would take different volumes of the mixed liquid on different days. So to illustrate this, we now have a system with three pipes coming in from the left and three pipes emerging from the right. What would happen in this case is that the nitrogen-rich water, the normal rainwater, 
and the phosphorus-rich water would mix up at the blue gizmo and, if it is above a certain volume, will be allowed to pass onto the right. So if, for example, the width of the nitrogen-rich water pipe was 0.5 and the width of the rainwater pipe was 0.4 and the phosphorus-rich water pipe was 0.2, this would mean that only 50% of the nitrogen-rich water inputted will flow through the pipe, 40% of the rainwater inputted will flow through the pipe, and 20% of the phosphorus-rich water would flow through the pipe. So if on a Monday, 10 litres of each water inputs into each pipe, we would get 5 litres of nitrogen-rich water, 4 litres of normal rainwater, and 2 litres of phosphorus-rich water going into the blue gizmo. From this point, 5 litres, 4 litres, and 2 litres are added in the blue gizmo. So this equals 11 litres. Since this amount is high enough, it lets the mixed water pass through. From this point, the water is distributed. Obviously, the water isn't distributed correctly the first time, and an iterative process of readjusting the pipe widths is done to ensure that each plant gets the right amount of mixed water on each day. Now, imagine a more complex plumbing system made up of different types of gizmos and more connections between them, as well as more inputs and outputs across more days. This takes us into neural networks. In this video, we will cover at a very basic level the maths behind neural networks and how the neural network in the practical exercise that follows this video will work. If we recall, Farmer Rose has hydrangeas, daisies, and sunflowers on her farm. Now, every flower has a certain structure. Flowers have a stigma, which is responsible for the reception of pollen, a stamen, which is the male reproductive part of a flower, petals that are responsible for attracting potential pollinating insects, and a sepal, which acts as a defensive enclosure for the flower up until the point that the flower blooms. Now, it is actually possible to classify a flower as either a hydrangea, daisy, or sunflower based on the sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. For example, a flower with a sepal length of 6.3, a sepal width of 3.3, a petal length of 6.0, and a petal width of 2.5 would be classified as a sunflower. Now, neural networks work with numbers and not words or letters, so having an output of a word like sunflower isn't feasible. So to help with this, a possible solution could be to label the hydrangeas, daisies, and sunflowers with numbers. For example, hydrangeas would be labeled with zero, daisies would be labeled with one, and sunflowers would be labeled with two. This is referred to as integer encoding. Now, that is a possible solution. However, it is not one that we will be using. Instead, we will be using something called one-hot encoding. So, if we think of the number one representing true and the number zero representing false, then we could say that an output of one, zero, zero could represent a positive classification for a hydrangea an output of 0, 1, 0 could represent a positive classification for a daisy, and an output of 0, 0, 1 could represent a positive classification for a sunflower. For our purposes, however, I would like to think of 1 representing a 100% probability of a flower being a certain type, and 0 representing a 0% probability of a flower being a certain type. So going back to our model, we know that these inputs represent a sunflower, 
And since a one hot encoded output for a sunflower is 0, 0, 1, we can write 0, 0, 1 right here. Now, the neural network has weights which are updated through a training process to take in certain inputs and produce the appropriate outputs. The weights are multiplied by the inputs and then added up at this contraption. We previously called this a gizmo. However, in a neural network, it is called a neuron. The neuron takes the sum of the weighted inputs and acts on them according to what is called an activation function. So, for example, if we had the weights 1, 3, 5, and 13, we would multiply each weight by the input and pass it through the neuron's activation function. This specific neuron has a ReLU or rectified linear units activation function. So it would pass out the sum that was inputted if the sum is greater or equal to zero and output zero if the sum was less than zero. Since the sum is greater than zero, it would output the sum. This sum is then multiplied by the weights coming out of the neuron. Now, these outputs aren't exactly what we are looking for, so they need to be normalized using a softmax layer at the end. This softmax layer is made up of softmax neurons, which could be seen as another type of gizmo. The softmax layer takes in the output to a certain softmax neuron and divides it by the sum of the outputs to that whole layer. This results in a probability output instead. So, in essence, the inputted values, according to our trained neural network, would have a 6% probability of belonging to a hydrangea, a 13% probability of belonging to a daisy, and an 80% probability of belonging to a sunflower. This results in the neural network classifying the inputted features as that of a sunflower. In this video, we are going to go through a practical implementation of a neural network in Python. So step one is to open up Jupyter Notebook. To do this, open the command prompt, type in Jupyter Notebook and click enter. This should open up this window. Click the option Python 3 IPyKernel to open up a notebook. Now I have already filled out this notebook with code, but I do suggest that you follow along by typing out the code as I explain it. To add a new cell to type out the code, click the plus button under the file option on top. To run the code in a particular cell, click the run option. The first cell of code imports the necessary TensorFlow, NumPy, and Pandas libraries that we have previously installed. TensorFlow will allow us to build and train machine learning models, while NumPy and Pandas allows us to work with and visualize data. The next cell stores the path to the adapted Iris CSV file that was required to be downloaded for this tutorial. This file is attached as a resource to this video. To get this path, Go to the folder that the adapted iris dataset is stored in, right-click on that file, click the Properties option, go to the Security tab, and then copy the path of this file. Please note that we must use single quotation marks as well as put an R in front of the path due to the path containing backslashes instead of forward slashes. The next cell prints out the first five instances of the dataset. All five instances here are classified as hydrangeas. The next cell shows the first instance of the hydrangea, daisy, and sunflower classification. 
So the first feature vector representing a hydrangea is at the first position or position zero of the array, as a programmer would say. The first feature vector representing a daisy is at position 50, and the first feature vector representing a sunflower is at position 100. If you look at the CSV file, you will see the same thing. Now, in supervised machine learning, we have inputs and outputs used to train a model. The inputs in our case are the sepal and petal lengths and widths, which are stored in columns one and two in our datasets. And the outputs are the plant types, which are stored in column three. Next, we store the inputs found in columns with indices zero to three in a variable called x, which will basically look like a collection of arrays, each representing an input feature vector. In the same way, a variable y stores the outputs for each input feature vector in its own array. Now, the next two cells use integer encoding on the plant type outputs to convert them into numbers. Integer encoding is required as a step before one-hot encoding. In our case, a hydrangea is encoded as one, a daisy is encoded as zero, and a sunflower is encoded as two. Not ideal, as you would prefer the hydrangea and daisy encoding to be swapped, but please just keep this in mind. The next cell converts the integer encoded outputs into one hot encoded outputs. Since the first 50 cells represent hydrangeas, we see the one hot encoded outputs for hydrangeas here, which is 0, 1, 0. In the same way, a one hot encoded output for a daisy is 1, 0, 0. And a one hot encoded output for a sunflower is 0, 0, 1. So if our model takes in a feature vector and outputs 0 0.1, 0 0.8, and 0 0.1, we can assume that the feature vector belongs to a hydrangea. Next, we import a library called sklearn, a popular machine learning library which in this case will allow us to split our datasets into training and testing sets. The training set, as the name suggests, is used to train the model, and the testing set is used to test the accuracy of the model. The training and testing sets usually do not consist of the same instances. The testing set is supposed to represent unknown data. The dataset is split, with 80% of it going towards the training sets and 20% of it going towards the testing sets. Just as a note, we do not usually see datasets split with the first 50 instances representing one output, and the next representing another, and the next representing another. The instances with different outputs are usually mixed up. The sklearn library uses the random state parameter to mix the data. In the next four cells, we see the first six instances of the inputs and outputs of the training and testing set. The next cell is where we declare our model in terms of its structure. According to the code, our neural network model will have four inputs, two hidden layers made up of 10 neurons each, all consisting of the ReLU activation function, and a three node softmax output layer. The model will use the RMS prop optimizer and the categorical cross entropy loss function to help train it to get more and more accurate. The model is trained in batches of 50. This means that after every 50 instances, the weights will be readjusted. The model is trained for 100 epochs, which means that the model will pass through the entire dataset 100 times before it is done training. If we wish to train the model using more epochs, this may greatly improve the model's accuracy, however will take more time. By running this cell, the training process commences. As we can see, at earlier epochs, we get a model with a lower accuracy and greater loss. As we get to later epochs, we see a model with a higher accuracy and lower loss. The model is then tested on data that it has not been trained on using the test sets. 
According to this, the model accurately predicts a flower type 76.66% of the time on unknown data. This may be improved by increasing the number of epochs or increasing the size of the data sets as increasing the number of instances that the model is trained on will make it more capable of processing unknown data. The next three cells show the trained model being used on the testing sets to predict the flower type. The answers are stored in a variable called ypred. The first instance of the inputs in our testing set is shown to produce a 24% probability of belonging to a daisy, a 0.1% probability of belonging to a hydrangea, and a 75.46% probability of belonging to a sunflower. This means that the first instance of the test set would be classified as a sunflower. In the same way, the sixth instance of the test set stored in index 5 will be classified as a sunflower as well. In the final cell, we take an unknown set of sepal and petal lengths randomly made up by ourselves and use the model to predict the flower type. The model predicts these values as those belonging to a sunflower. So I've been on this island for some time, and I've decided that it's probably a good idea to buy some property. However, I'm a very thrifty guy, and will only commit to a purchase if the property is value for money. A real estate agent tells me that the factors that determine the value of a property are the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, and the overall square footage of the property. My plan is to build a system that can take these factors and use them to determine whether a property is value for money or greatly overpriced. Now, to build a system, I have two options. The first is to look at multiple properties, take their number of beds, bathrooms, and overall square footage, and then compare that to the corresponding price. By doing this over multiple properties, we build a mental model of what a house's price should be based on its features. Once we have built this mental model, we could look at an individual property, the number of beds, bathrooms, and overall square footage of that property, and then decide whether that property being looked at is value for money. The problem with this approach is that it is a completely manual process that takes effort and time. An alternative to this approach is the use of machine learning. Now, in a previous video, 
we used supervised machine learning to create a classification model that would take sepal and petal lengths and widths and produce a probabilistic output of what type of flower those inputs belonged to. The output layer was made up of a series of softmax neurons that would give a percentage probability of a set of inputs belonging to a particular flower type. This is a basic classification problem with a finite or discrete set of outcomes. Now, the difference between this classification problem and the house price problem is that a house price can range from zero to infinity and everything in between, whereas the classification problem only had a finite set of possible outcomes. A problem with an indeterminate set of outcomes is said to be a continuous problem, or a regression problem. To deal with this problem, we need to readjust the classification model so that it becomes a regression model. To do this, we can simply replace the softmax output layer at the end of the model with a single output neuron of the appropriate type. For example, a ReLU output neuron. Since the ReLU activation function produces outputs of zero and every number above that, it would be capable of taking in property features and producing an appropriate property price. In this video, we will implement a regression neural network that will allow us to calculate housing prices based on certain features. Just as a reminder, to open Jupyter Notebook, type Jupyter Notebook into the command prompt and then click Python 3 IPy kernel. Now, as a resource for this video, I have attached a CSV or comma separated values file that looks something like this. If we look at a neater version of the CSV file, what we see is a file that contains the features of different properties, which include the area of the property, all the way up to whether or not the property is furnished, as well as the price of the property. The information on the left could be set as inputs for a machine learning model, and the values on the right, the outputs. The first step in building this model is importing the required libraries for model creation and data processing. Next, store the path to the housing.csv file attached to this video in a variable called data folder. Now, when working with data, we can sometimes find that we have samples with no values for certain features. We can work around this using various techniques, such as replacing those missing values with the average of all values for that feature, or using other placeholder values. In this situation, we are just going to delete the entire column for that feature. The data is stored in a pandas data frame, which is very helpful when processing and visualizing the data. By using the .info method, we see that this data set is made up of 545 samples, each having 13 columns, which translates to 12 input features and one output feature. Using the .head method, we are able to see the topmost samples of the data set. Now, as we know, a neural network is an algorithm that uses input features multiplied by numerical weights to produce numerical outputs. Here, we have an issue where our data values are textual values, which cannot be multiplied by numbers. To fix this, we can use a pandas function on the columns with non-numerical values to one-hot encode them. After doing this, we see that we now have 21 columns instead of the original 13. If we look at numbers 6 and 7, we see that the main road column has disappeared and has been replaced with main road no and main road yes. We also see at positions 18 till 20, furnishing status to furnished, semi-furnished and unfurnished. When we look at the new data frame, we see that the columns now have ones and zeros in them instead of textual values. A one in main road yes, for example, would indicate that main road yes is true and a zero would indicate that it is not true. Effectively, we have gotten rid of all the textual values 
and replace them with numeric values. Now, if you notice, when we change this data set to hold one hot encoded values, the price column moved from the last column to column five. Let us store the prices or target values, AKA the outputs in a variable Y. Now, this may not be the most effective strategy, but we will then delete the price column from the data frame and then store the remaining values as input values in a variable called X. When we print the first sample of X, we get the first set of input feature vectors shown here. And when we print the first Y value, we get the price of the property that corresponds to that set of inputs. Now, here we have code that will allow us to scale the input data values, which would result in a normalized set of values. I have not run this code, but this code could be helpful when working with data where there is a large range between values of different features. Next, we build a neural network. The network consists of four hidden layers and a single linear output neuron at the end. The linear output neuron will produce output values between negative infinity and positive infinity. Next, we run code to train the model. The model is built over 1,500 epochs or iterations and uses batch sizes of 50 samples at a time. Now, when training our classification model, we noticed that as we went through more epochs, we saw models of increasing accuracy. If we look at what we have here, we see that as the epochs increase, the accuracy remains at zero or close to it. The reason for this is that when training a regression model, for the model to be considered 100% accurate, it needs to predict the price of property down to the last cent. Given that there is such a large possibility for error when predicting values in which the number of possible outcomes is so great, the chances of producing a model that has a 100% accuracy over the entire batch of samples is close to zero. What is then a better measure of the performance of a regression model is a metric called loss. Loss is essentially the difference between what is predicted versus what the actual value is. So for example, if I use a supervised model to predict the outputs of some set of inputs and the model predicts five, when the actual output for that sample is seven, then the loss of that model would be seven minus five, which would be two. The ultimate objective when training the regression model is to get to a model where we have minimized the loss. If we look at the output of this cell, we can see the loss decreasing as we move through epochs. We also see two other values, MSE and MAE, decreasing as we move along in epochs. These values are the mean squared error and mean absolute error. When deciding which machine learning algorithm to use for a particular task, one could calculate these metrics on the testing sets and use them to determine which regression model is best suited to be implemented for a given task. To recap, when looking at the performance of a classification model, given that we only have a finite amount of possible classifications, it is easier to use the accuracy metric to determine a model's performance. However, in a regression problem, where a model could predict a property's price to be $1 million and one cent, and the actual price of that house was $1 million and two cents, the metric of loss, mean squared error, and mean absolute error would be more useful as in this case, just because the model was off by one cent, the model would still be shown to have a 0% accuracy. We can plot a graph to measure the decrease in loss of the model over a number of epochs. And as we see, the training and validation loss decreases as the epochs increase. Now, what I have in this cell is a random set of house features that I will put into my trained model. The trained model predicts the house prices based on these features to be around $9 million. If we look at the CSV file, this shows a house price in the middle range. 
In the next cell, we calculate the mean squared error and mean absolute error of the model on the training sets and thereafter on the testing sets. A model may not always perform as well as we think it should. To improve the performance, we could increase the amount of data samples or we could increase the number of epochs that the model is trained on, among other things. Now, it isn't feasible to retrain a model every time you want to use it, so we can save the neural network model and its weight in an H5 file. You can choose the path you want, but ensure that it is saved as something like housingmodel.h5. To load the saved model and reuse it, apply the code in cells 61 and 62. Up until this point, we've mentioned the word model a lot. But what exactly is a model? For our purposes, we can define a model as an instrument that allows us to describe how something works. For example, our heliocentric model of the Earth and Sun describes the Earth as a spherical object revolving around the Sun. Another example could be the amount of corn that Farmer Jack harvests over a period of time. If he harvests 1 kg in one day, 2 kg in two days, and 3 kg in three days, we could model the amount of corn that he harvests as y equals x, where the amount of corn harvested directly maps to the number of days. Now, let's say Farmer Jack had two horses on his farm named Jane and Lisbon. Jane and Lisbon need to eat as much food as they can so that they can grow up to be strong enough to enter the Kentucky Derby. Farmer Jack decides to feed Jane and Lisbon a special type of food, which only lasts one day. That is, it expires after one day and then needs to be replaced. Jane and Lisbon will either eat all the food or the amount that they are capable of eating on a specific day, whichever comes first. So for example, if Jane is capable of eating two cages of food on a Monday and Farmer Jack feeds him one kg, he will eat all the food However, he will have not been able to eat the amount that he is truly capable of eating. If Farmer Jack feeds Jane 3 kg on a Tuesday, but Jane is only capable of eating 1 kg on a Tuesday, 1 kg will be eaten and 2 kg of food will be wasted. Farmer Jack's main goal is to ensure that his horses get fed as much food as possible, while at the same time ensuring that he wastes as little food as possible. He decides to build a model to feed both Jane and Lisbon, which he trains using Jane's feeding habits over seven days. The points on the graph here show the amounts of food that Jane eats over seven days. Now, Farmer Jack decides to use a machine learning algorithm called linear regression to build a model. This algorithm fits a straight line to the training sets. However, if we notice, the data does not follow a straight line trajectory and instead curves to various degrees. This results in the linear regression model showing what is called a large degree of bias. We can define bias as the error between the average model prediction and ground truth. A model with high bias does not tend to match the dataset closely and hence does not give a true representation of the data. This may result in a phenomenon called underfitting and a more generalized model with a high error rate. Models with a high bias have a low variance, which will be explained shortly. If we look at the linear regression model, no matter how we orient the straight line, we never see a model that can truly represent the data. Now, since the straight line achieved from linear regression does not fit the data nearly as closely as it should, Farmer Jack decides to use another model that curves and flows exactly in the same way that Jane's eating habits curve and flow. This model fits the training data perfectly. At this point, he has what he considers to be a very satisfactory model that should be able to feed both Jane and Lisbon in a way that ensures their optimum growth while reducing the amount of food wastage. Now, let us plot Lisbon's feeding pattern on the graph. If you notice, 
while the model is able to feed Jane and reduce waste very well, it is unable to do the same for Lisbon. We see days that the model provides much more food than Lisbon is capable of eating, and days where not enough food is provided to match Lisbon's eating capability. In this case, what has happened is that the model has overfitted itself to the training data, and hence does not have the flexibility to predict to a reasonable degree the amount of food that should be allocated for an animal that it was not trained on. Essentially, it cannot adapt to unknown data. This overfitted model is said to have a high variance. Models with high variance pay a lot of attention to training data and do not generalize well on data which it has not seen before. An important thing to know is that a model with a high variance will always have a low bias, and a model with a high bias will always have a low variance. Now, Farmer Jack decides to use a final model, which turns out to be the most optimal model. The model, which we see here, does not perfectly match or overfit the training data. However, at the same time, it is not so far away from the training or testing data that it results in a large degree of food wastage or suboptimal consumption by the horses. This model is capable of feeding both horses the greatest amount of food, while at the same time ensuring the least amount of food wastage possible. The model does not match the training data perfectly, and hence there will be a degree of error, which means that the model does come with a degree of bias. At the same time, the model does not overfit to the training data, and hence has the flexibility to generalize to data which it has not seen before. The model does have a degree of variance, however, not as much as the model that fitted the training data perfectly. This kind of model represents what is known as the bias-variance trade-off. In machine learning, we need to ensure that the models we use for specific tasks are appropriately chosen to provide the necessary bias-variance trade-off. Certain tasks may require models that overfit to the training data, while others require models that show a high degree of bias. There is no machine algorithm that acts as a one-size-fits-all algorithm for every single problem. Model algorithms need to be appropriately chosen depending on the problem it needs to solve. This ties into a concept called the no free lunch rule, which will be covered soon. A machine learning algorithm can improve on its bias and variance by using a larger training set, choosing training set instances that are not too similar, performing data augmentation on the training set, as well as other methods such as regularization and boosting. In this video, we are going to cover a very basic overview of decision trees, an algorithm that can be used for both regression and classification problems. As the name suggests, a decision tree is a decision-making algorithm that models a series of choices up until certain outcomes in a tree-like fashion. The tree is drawn upside down with its root at the top. For example, let's take an executive at Funimation who wants to try and maximize the amount of Dragon Ball Z figurines they sell, while at the same time trying to keep marketing costs as low as possible. To do this, the executive needs to ensure that advertisements for the toys go directly to the people that are most likely to buy them. The executive decides that the most important factors that determine whether a person buys a figurine or not is their gender, their age, and whether or not they have children. It is also decided that out of these three factors, the most important factor is a person's gender. If a person is a male, this indicates a high probability that that person would buy a Dragon Ball Z figurine, and if the opposite, this indicates a lower probability. Now, the executive does not want to market to every single male on the planet, but instead wants to create focused, targeted advertisements. So they go a step further by looking at whether a male is under 17 or over 17 before sending an advert to them. To add to this, the executive designed the tree so that if a male is over 17 
or if the person is female and they do have children, they would also receive targeted ads. So looking at this decision tree, if a person is male and under 17, they will receive an advert. If they are male and over 17, they will only receive an advert if they have children. And if they are female, they will only receive an advert if they have children. Now, if you notice, the most important feature when designing this decision tree, the gender, is located at the top or root node of the tree. As we go deeper into the tree, we find features of lower weighting being what distinguishes which people get Dragon Ball Z figurine advertisements and which do not. While the Funimation executive needs to carefully design the tree using critical thinking as to which features are at the top or how exactly the tree branches out and how it looks eventually, a machine learning algorithm does this automatically. It does this by taking a training set of inputs, in this case being a person's gender, age, and whether or not they have children, and the outputs for those inputs, that being whether a person perhaps bought a Dragon Ball Z toy in the past, and creates a tree that is fitted to that training data. Now, it is important to know that traditionally, decision trees tend to be models that overfit to the training data. This means that the model so closely resembles the training data that it may not be able to easily classify an unknown data sample if that data sample does not closely resemble samples in the training set. Another thing to note about decision trees is that they give a significantly higher weighting to features on the top of the tree in comparison to features found as you move to the bottom. This can contrast with other machine learning algorithms, for example, multiple linear regression. In this video, we will discuss an extremely important concept in machine learning called the no free lunch theorem. The no free lunch theorem essentially says that there is no single machine learning algorithm that acts as a one size fits all solution for every single problem. A machine learning engineer needs to use their experience to determine the strengths and weaknesses of different algorithms and which algorithm would be most appropriate for different problems. For example, let's look at two algorithms, neural networks and decision trees. A neural network tends to have a medium degree of variance and bias. That is to say that neural network models, if trained correctly, do not tend to overfit to the training data, however, still model the training data to a reasonable degree and are not just completely general. Neural networks also do not tend to favor certain features to a far larger degree than others, unlike decision trees, which give a higher weighting to features at the top of the tree and lower weighting to features further down. If we wanted to use a machine learning model on a task like predicting the winner of a horse race, a neural network would make more sense as the large number of features that could contribute to a general idea of which horse would win a race would be easier to process using a more general model like a neural network. If we wanted to create a machine learning model that would be able to diagnose a person's illness based on certain features and thereafter medicate them, it may make more sense to use a decision tree which tends to overfit on the training data. If we want to diagnose a patient, we want to be certain that their symptoms match to a large degree a specific disease, and hence we would prefer to use a model that is not as general, but instead follows a reasonably definite path from symptoms passed in to the diagnosis classification at the end. Up until this point, we have covered supervised machine learning used to classify flower types and predict the prices of property. The models that we used trained themselves using both input feature vectors as well as the outputs for those respective inputs. This process entailed actually having the outputs for the respective input feature vectors. However, we are not always lucky enough to have both inputs and outputs to train models on. Sometimes we only have the input feature vectors which we have to somehow use to train our model. This brings us to the concept of unsupervised machine learning. 
In this lesson, we will discuss the use of unsupervised machine learning to help solve classification problems. Going back to the island of Ara Mamore, we find ourselves at Farmer Earl's farm. Now, Farmer Earl has three different types of animals on his farm, that being pigeons, hippos, and giraffes. Farmer Earl wants to build a machine learning model that allows him to classify an animal as a pigeon, hippopotamus, or giraffe. He finds a bunch of feature vectors representing animals on his farm. These feature vectors are made up of an animal's leg thickness and height. He decides to use the feature vectors to build a model to classify the animals, but unfortunately, he does not have the outputs of the feature vectors to train the model on. So what can he do in this case? Well, firstly, let's plot the feature vectors on a graph like so. Now, Farmer Earl decides that he is going to demarcate regions around certain points in certain colors. Points located in the maroon area will always be classified as hippos, points located in the blue area will always be classified as pigeons, and points located in the green area will always be classified as giraffes. So basically, if an unknown feature vector has a height and leg width that places it in the maroon area, it will be classified as a hippopotamus. Now, a problem with the way that he demarcated the areas is that it does not classify things in a way that makes sense. For example, if you look at this point, we see a feature vector that shows an animal with a medium height being classified as a giraffe. This indicates that the way in which Farmer Earl demarcated regions on the graph was incorrectly done. What would happen at this point is that Farmer Earl would have to try a few different types of demarcation configurations, which would eventually lead him to a model that looks something like this. As we can see, the model would appropriately classify a pigeon as a short animal with skinny legs, a hippo as a medium height animal with thick legs, and a giraffe as a tall animal with legs of medium thickness. If he places an unknown feature vector in the blue region, that feature vector which shows a short animal with skinny legs would be classified as a pigeon. This model was trained with only input feature vectors and no outputs. Now, while Farmer Earl would have to use trial and error to create the appropriate model, the process that a computer would use is a little different. A computer uses something called a centroid to help create demarcated areas around it. A centroid is a central point that can move around. As it moves around, the area around it essentially becomes a demarcated area that determines whether something is classified as one thing or another. In this video, we are going to implement k-means clustering in Jupyter Notebook. The first step is to import the required libraries. Now in this lesson, we are not going to import data from an external source like a petal dataset or a CSV file, but instead randomly generate a set of 2D feature vectors with no corresponding outputs. To do this, we need to import the make blobs functionality from sklearn. We also need to import the matplotlib library so that we can visualize this data. Since these are two feature or 2D feature vectors, we can plot them on a 2D plane. We create the dataset and store it in a variable called dataset. This dataset is made up of 200 2D feature vectors, which is set using the n samples value. Now, when our dataset is created, what we are going to get are a number of randomly generated 2D feature vectors. However, these feature vectors are not completely random and instead use a center to give them an idea of which region to position themselves in. A good way of thinking of this is to think of three galaxies that are very close to each other. If you look at these three galaxies from the right perspective and distance, the stars seem to all belong to the same galaxy. However, there are three separate supermassive black holes at the center of each galaxy that cause a gravitational force that results in certain stars belonging to one galaxy or another. We will visualize this soon so it will make sense. Ultimately, we are creating random data samples 
where one third of the samples originates around one center, however can exist away from that center by a standard deviation of 1.6, and another third and another third doing the same thing. Now, if we print our data sets, what we have is an array object that is made up of one array consisting of the 2D input feature vectors that we want, as well as another array of the outputs for those input feature vectors. We could think of these outputs representing the galaxies that these input feature vectors belong to or their classifications. Unfortunately, the make blobs method creates the dataset so that we have both the inputs and the outputs. For the purposes of this lesson, we want to look at how a machine can discern which feature vectors belong to a certain class and which belong to another without having any outputs to train itself on. So we create a new variable, points, which will store only the input feature vectors and not the outputs. When we print the data stored in points, we get the output shown here. Now, what we want to create is ultimately a model that can classify these unknown feature vectors without using any output to train themselves on. To do this, we need to use an unsupervised algorithm called k-means clustering. Remember, at this point, all the machine has is a set of 2D feature vectors without any defined outputs that we want the k-means clustering algorithm to classify into three distinct classes. To do this, we need to specify that we want three clusters. Next, we fit this model to the data point. Before we show the result, let's first visualize the two feature data points on a two-dimensional plane. As a human, it's quite simple to look at these points and even without distinctions, recognize that certain samples belong to one cluster or classification and certain samples probably belong to another. A computer does not have this inherent intelligence and has to instead use certain mathematical and statistical algorithms to properly define and create separation between things. Now, while we as humans could quite simply discern the different groups of samples present on a plot diagram, if we had to do this on a dataset with three features, this would get significantly more difficult. And if we had to go above three features, this would be near impossible, as visualizing something in four dimensions or higher is extremely difficult as humans living in a 3D world. This brings us to another benefit of machine learning, which is the fact that we can perform these classifications on data with more than three features. While we see a 2D graph on screen, this is simply used to easily illustrate how unsupervised machine learning works and does not mean that we cannot form clusters around feature vectors of more than two or three dimensions. Now, as mentioned, k-means clustering uses a centroid to form a region around itself within which certain samples are classified as one thing or another. The centroids are created and shown here. And then we use the fit predict method to designate certain classifications to certain samples. To visualize our classified datasets, use the code shown here. As we can see, we have three distinct sets of 2D feature vectors with differently colored stars in the center of each set representing the centroids for each cluster. The last type of machine learning that we need to discuss in this course is the use of unsupervised machine learning for regression problems. Unsupervised learning, of course, deals with the creation of models in situations where there is no output to train an input on. Regression problems refer to problems in which there can be an infinite number of potential outputs, which contrast with classification problems in which there is only a finite amount of possible ways that inputs could be classified. An example of a regression model is a neural network that predicts housing prices. This model is capable of producing an indeterminate amount of outputs ranging from zero to the highest possible house price. In this video, we are going to discuss unsupervised learning used for regression problems with the help of a concept called dimensionality reduction. 
Now, as we know, with machine learning, we are trying to create models to help us solve problems. One problem that we may be faced with is a situation where our data is so complex that it is extremely difficult to visualize, which may be less than ideal when perhaps presenting that data to a client, or the data is so complex that our computers have a hard time processing it. To help with a situation like this, we can use a technique called dimensionality reduction. Let's say we had a data set where each sample was made up of three features, feature A, feature B, and feature C. If we wanted to plot this data on a graph for a group of our coworkers to visualize, we would use a graph with three axes, an x-axis for feature A, a y-axis for feature B, and a z-axis for feature C. This is a simple three-dimensional coordinate system. However, if we had four features, we would now be required to plot the data onto a graph with four dimensions. As humans living in a 3D world, this would be very difficult to visualize. By using dimensionality reduction on the dataset with four features, we are able to convert a four-feature dataset to a three-feature dataset. Now, how is this done? Two possible methods are feature elimination and feature extraction. Feature elimination, as the name suggests, is done by quite simply dropping features. If we wanted to turn an eight-feature dataset into a three-feature dataset, we may remove five features we deem to be the least important and keep the most important three. The benefit of feature elimination is that it is an extremely simple process and allows one to maintain the interpretability of the remaining features. However, the disadvantage is that by dropping variables, you may lose crucial information and the potential benefits that that information may have provided. The alternative to feature elimination is feature extraction, which we could sort of look at as a large number of features being compressed into a smaller number of features. For example, if I had a two-feature dataset, I could plot this dataset on a Cartesian plane with an x and y axis. To visualize this two-dimensional dataset as a one-dimensional dataset, we could simply look at the data from an aerial view. Now I can represent each sample using only one value, that being the straight line distance from the origin, instead of using x and y coordinates. Another way of looking at this is when it comes to taking a photograph. When we point the camera, we are pointing at three-dimensional objects in the real world, and by using a shift of perspective, we can represent these 3D objects in a 2D image. A popular technique for feature extraction is principal components analysis. Principal components analysis allows us to compress data with more features into a dataset with fewer features with the added benefit that the new features after extraction are completely independent of each other. In this video, we will implement principal components analysis on a breast cancer dataset. This dataset belongs to the preloaded SKLearn datasets and can be loaded on the fly. Step one is to import the required libraries for this task. The libraries imported here will allow us to load visualize and process the data in various ways, including normalizing the data, which is important as the values cannot have large degrees of separation between them when using PCA. Normalization refers to the process of taking multiple data values and readjusting them so that they meet the needs of certain processing tasks. For example, if I had numbers ranging from one to 10,000, I would have certain numbers being very small, close to 1, and certain numbers being extremely large, like 8,900. I could normalize these values to be within the range of 0 to 1 by dividing each value by 10,000. The next step is to load the dataset into a variable called data. Now, this data is stored in a special kind of way, where what we actually have is an array of arrays with different keys. For example, if I use the key feature names, 
it shows me the actual description of what each input feature represents. If I use the key target names, it shows me that I have two classifications, that being malignant or benign. We at this point are only interested in the input values and the output values. To list the first input feature vector in the dataset, we would use the data key and indicate that we want the sample in the zeroth position. This sample corresponds to classification of zero, which, given that malignant is in position zero of the target name's array, gives it a malignant classification. By printing both the data and targets, we can get a better idea of how the inputs and outputs are set up. The next step is to construct a data frame and then scale the data for normalization before using PCA to reduce the dimensionality of the data. As we see here, we have set n components to 3, which means that our data of 30 features will be reduced down to 3 features. The different colors separate the malignant and benign samples. As we can see, the graph shows a clear distinction between the yellow and blue samples, which indicates that the principal component analysis was able to effectively reduce the original data's dimensionality, while at the same time preserving important information that would be able to separate malignant and benign samples. To reduce the original dataset into two features, we can simply set n components to two. Thereafter, we can visualize it on a 2D plane, like so. Just like adding pineapple to pizza, to create something greater than the sum of its parts. We can, in a similar way, combine different machine learning algorithms to create what are called ensemble models that may show a higher performance than the individual models that made it up in the first place. The first example of this could be the use of both a regression neural network combined with a multiple linear regression model to predict house prices. The neural network would take input features and produce a price, and then the multiple linear regression model would take in the same features and produce another price. Thereafter, you could add both prices produced from the two models and get the average. In a situation where we cannot decide which model to use to predict a house's price, the average prediction of two models may make more sense. Another example could be the use of supervised machine learning coupled with unsupervised machine learning. For example, if we had a training set with the inputs being the petal length, petal width, sepal length and sepal width of three different flowers, and the outputs being the type of flower, we could train a supervised model to classify a flower based on its sepal and petal lengths and widths, and then combine this with three unsupervised models which would be able to predict the flower's age and whether it was ready to be picked or not. The original dataset does not have the outputs of the flower's ages, so to find this, we would need to use unsupervised learning. In this video, we will implement two different supervised regression algorithms to calculate the price of properties, and then find the average of the outputs from each model effectively creating an ensemble model. The two algorithms we are going to use are a neural network and a multiple linear regression model. To implement the neural network, we use pretty much the exact same process we did in a previous video. First, import the required libraries for model creation and data processing. Then, store the path to the CSV file attached as a resource to this video. The CSV file will be the exact same housing dataset as used in the regression neural network lesson. Next, drop the rows with missing data and look at the info in the data frame that you have stored the CSV information in. Look at the topmost rows in that data frame. Use one hot encoding on the values with textual variables to convert them into numeric variables. Now, look at the transformed data frame. Look at the topmost rows of the new transform data frame. Next, 
store the target values in column 5 of the data frame in a variable y. Delete the price column in the data frame and then store the remaining values as input values in a variable called x. Print the first input sample, which would correspond to the first output sample. Use the code to scale the input data if you wish. Then build a model. In this situation, we only set the number of epochs to 500. This would most likely result in a model that is less accurate than a model you have trained for more epochs. But the purpose of this lesson is to understand how an ensemble model works and not to get the highest performing model. So to save training time, we will use 500 epochs. Next, we can plot the loss of the neural network model as we increase the number of epochs. So now we have built a neural network model called model that can be used to predict property prices based on input features. Before we use that built model, let us build another model called Regger. This model differs from the previous model in that it is not a neural network with weights, but instead a linear regression model. To build this model, we simply import the appropriate package from sklearn and then fit the model to our training set. Next, let us create a random array of house feature inputs called house attributes. We then first call the neural network model model to predict the value of the property based on these inputs. Thereafter, we use the multiple linear regression model, Rega, to predict the property prices based on the same inputs. Once we have both the neural network and linear regression model outputs, we find the average and use this as our final solution. Now, just as a bonus, what we have here are two different regression algorithms. If we decided that we would prefer to use only one of them, we could measure the performance of each algorithm and choose the highest performing one. In this case, we are going to use the metric of mean absolute error to determine which model performs better. According to our finding, the multiple linear regression model performs better in this case as it shows a lower mean absolute error. This would suggest that if we wanted to implement a model to perhaps some sort of commercial endeavor, the multiple linear regression model would serve us better. While the multiple linear regression model shows a better performance in this case, it should be noted that we only train the neural network for 500 epochs. Sometimes we need to ensure that a particular model is trained and built correctly before deciding with finality that a particular model is better than another. We could improve the structure of the model by, for example, adding or decreasing the amount of neurons or hidden layers or using other techniques such as a dropout to improve the model. In this case, our neural network is decently built and should be improved by increasing the number of epochs that it is trained on. As we know, the world was recently affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. In an attempt to reduce the impact of the virus, governments deployed various testing strategies to help slow down its spread. The most popular testing methods were the RT-PCR and antigen test. However, in certain segments of the population, various machine learning based testing methods were also utilized. One of these methods involved taking long CT scans, extracting features from them using convolutional neural networks, and eventually classifying those CT scans as either COVID-19 positive or negative based on the features. Now, this process involved taking lung scans with known diagnoses and using them to train a machine learning model. Ultimately, supervised machine learning used to create a classification model. When it comes to machine learning models, we may need to test the performance of the model using certain metrics. An example of a metric is the metric accuracy. Accuracy can be calculated 
by taking the number of correctly predicted samples and dividing that by the total number of samples. For example, if I took 100 lung CT scans and correctly classified 98 out of the 100, this would mean that I have a model that is 98% accurate. Surely this means that accuracy is the best metric to determine the performance of a model? Well, actually, this isn't the case. Let's say I had a classification model for lung scans that was so badly built or trained that it would only classify lung scans as COVID-19 negative, regardless of whether the lung scan was positive or negative. If I had 50 positive lung scans and 50 negative lung scans, which is an even distribution of data, and then tested the model's accuracy on the lung scans, I would correctly predict 50 out of the 100 lung scans, which would show my model to be 50% accurate. However, if I had a testing data set made up of 10 COVID positive lung scans and 9,990 COVID negative lung scans, which sums up to 10,000 lung scans overall, my model would correctly predict 9,990 of the 10,000 lung scans, which would show that it is 99.9% .9 accurate. And remember, we are only talking about an extremely basic classifier that only outputs a negative prediction regardless of what is inputted. In the same way, if I had a classifier that only produced positive classifications regardless of whatever was inputted, I would have 10 out of the 10,000 lung scans being classified correctly, which would mean that my classifier is only 0.1% accurate. Now, in a world where there may not always be an even distribution of data to measure a model's accuracy, like for example, at the start of the pandemic, where there were very few lung scans that were COVID positive and a lot more that were COVID negative, it is important to use other metrics to measure a model's performance. Before we get into that, let us first talk about confusion matrices. A confusion matrix is a table that helps us to describe the performance of a model. When we have our training data, what we have is data that is actually meant to be classified as positive and data that is actually meant to be classified as negative. Then we take our model and try to classify that data. What we get from our model is data that is either predicted as positive or predicted as negative. Now, when we have data that is predicted as positive actually being positive, what we have is a true positive. When we have data that is predicted as positive but is actually negative, what we have is a false positive. When we have data that is predicted to be negative and is actually positive, this is a false negative. And finally, when we have data that is predicted to be negative, actually being negative, this is a true negative. Moving back to our COVID-19 example, we have a testing set of 10 lung scans that are actually positive and 9,990 that are actually negative. If we take the first classifier, which classifies every image as negative, we know that zero images would be classified as positive, which means that the intersection of images that are classified as being positive actually being positive are zero, and in the same way, the intersection of images being classified as positive actually being negative is also zero. Moving on to the negatively predicted images, we have 10,000 images being predicted as negative, 10 of which, which are actually positive, and 9,990 of which, which are actually negative. Now that we have built our confusion matrix, we can discuss two metrics called precision and recall. Precision is calculated by taking the number of true positives and dividing it by the sum of true positives and false positives. Recall is calculated by taking the number of true positives and dividing it by the sum of true positives and false negatives. If we calculate the precision of this model on our dataset, we get an undefined precision, which is an extremely negative sign. 
And if we calculate the recall, we get a recall of zero, which itself also speaks to how weak our classifier is. Ideally, both the precision and recall should be as close to one as possible. The precision and recall values here give a far better indication of how poor our model is in comparison to the accuracy, which gave us 99.9% .9 or 0 0.999. For the fun of it, let's change the model to only classify lung scans as COVID positive, regardless of whatever lung scan was inputted. When using the new classifier, we see zero false negatives and true negatives as there are no negative predictions and 10 true positives because there are 10 positive samples in the test set and 9,990 false positives as the classifier predicts the 9,990 negative samples as positive. Using these values, we get a precision of 0 0.001 and a recall of 1. While we get a high recall, we also have a really low precision, which indicates low performance. Getting a balance between high precision and recall values would be the optimal scenario. Now, let's say I have a classification model called Model X that produces for a certain task a precision of 0 0.7 and a recall of 0 0.6. And then I have another classification model, Model Y, that for the same task produces a precision of 0 0.8 and a recall of 0 0.5. Overall, these models seem to be equal in their performance just by taking the averages. However, the model that I would choose would depend heavily on the task at hand. For example, if I had a task like detecting COVID in lung scans, where if a person was COVID positive, they would have to quarantine themselves in order to help prevent the spread of the virus, and if I had a large number of people being incorrectly classified as COVID negative, that is, a large number of false negatives, this would mean that COVID positive people would re-enter society, contributing to a more rapid spread of the virus. Given that in this case, false negatives are more important to consider when determining the performance of our model, the recall metric would be more important. A greater amount of false negatives would result in a lower recall. If, however, I had a situation where I perhaps wanted to use machine learning to diagnose a person as anemic or not anemic, it may make more sense to prioritize false positives. If a person is misdiagnosed to have anemia, that is, the model produces a false positive, they would take medication that may dangerously elevate the amount of iron in their blood, causing greater health problems than what they are already suffering with. Ensuring that there are fewer false positives is more important in this case, and hence, precision may be a better performance metric to use when comparing models tasked with diagnosing anemia. On top of this, we also have a metric called F-beta score, which is calculated using the formula shown on screen. Beta is a variable that could range between 0 and 1. A greater beta would give more importance to precision and less to recall, and a smaller beta the opposite. This metric could come in handy when you want to incorporate both precision and recall into a model's performance determination. It is up to the machine learning engineer to decide which metric should have more weighting by increasing or decreasing beta. Finally, we have a metric called Receiver Operating Characteristic, which is calculated by first plotting a graph of the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. Once this graph is plotted, the Receiver Operating Characteristic can be found by calculating the area under this graph. These metrics can be calculated using TensorFlow, Keras, or sklearn packages and libraries. Hi everyone, congratulations on making it to the end of this course. I hope that you've enjoyed your time and found a lot of value in what was covered. I'd like to wish you all the best on your machine learning journey and hope that this course has given you a decent foundation of this topic to build on over time. That's it from me for now. All the best.